We encourage you to hit the subscribe button right now so you can listen to more podcasts of Operation Truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we do want to hear from you, so we encourage you to email us at directly at operationtruthofficial at gmail.com. I want you to know that your messages are likely to be heard, addressed, and listened to on air. Operation Truth, the show they don't want you to see. Now, here's your host, Lou. Hello, everyone. This is Lou Palumbo, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Tom Fuentes, the former assistant director of the FBI, and we also have the pleasure of having with us again, I shouldn't say again, it's the, actually our first time, Chris Schwecker was in again. Um, for the first time, Kevin Brock, another former assistant director of the FBI, but probably of more significance in today's timeline is the fact that he was one of the architects co-authored this letter that was sent to our Congress expressing grave concern over the, the, the security of this nation. So, Kevin, I want to bring you in with Tom right away, and thank you for joining us, and I know this is going to get real interesting. Thanks, Lou. It's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, Chris Walker's much better looking, so I don't blame you for having him on multiple times. Well, if, <laughs> it was Tom's doing. I want to be honest with you. <laughs> anyway... So I want to start off as I usually do, and I have since I started this podcast almost three years ago, about this border issue. And without going into singing my anthem about um, Between the Lines, which was the podcast, and warning people that this was going to be a problem, we're living it today, Kevin. Would you agree? Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> it was actually Chris and I who started the discussion about crafting a letter to Congress, and uh, we quickly obtained agreement from eight other former senior FBI officials, colleagues of ours in the past. We could have gotten a number of, of other signers to to get uh, sign this letter. But in the interest of time and the sense of urgency, we we uh, we went with the 10 that signed it. Uh, we also didn't want to have comparisons drawn between our letter and the goofy letter sent by 51 former uh, intelligence community executives a couple of years ago, um, alleging that the Hunter Biden laptop was a Russian dis, uh, disinformation uh, campaign. Uh, we wanted our letter to look totally apolitical and just stress the immense threat that has now presented itself now exists in this country because of the policies enacted three years ago the border was effectively opened to anyone who came to the border. They were automatically received and allowed into the country with some distant future court date for uh, due process. Um, and without any vetting, as you pointed out earlier uh, in our discussion before the show, really no idea of who these people are and, uh, and what their backgrounds were in any great uh, detail. <clears throat> what particularly has concerned us over the last three years, we've seen a flip in the demographics of those coming to the border. For years, the majority, the vast majority were poor families, you know, seeking some, some relief. And, um, and now over 65% of those coming to the border are single adult unaccompanied males of military age from very uh, dangerous parts of the world, either from countries that are state sponsors of terrorism or mm -hmm. from terror regions or from China and Russia. Um, and, and it's this has been a spike or a surge that has occurred just over the last three years. Our concern was that this surge was intentional, mm -hmm. that it has a strategic and operational aspect to it, particularly um, when it comes to the young men presenting from uh, countries that have been known to be involved in terrorism or China. Um, and we have now allowed into the country tens of thousands of these single military aged males who at some time in the future could become operational at the behest of a terror group or a hostile nation. 
Um, so we, uh, we believed that there was not enough attention being paid to this issue. It was not getting the, uh, it was not getting the um, type of discussion that it merited. So we thought we'll send a letter to Congress. We didn't release it to the press. We sent it directly to the Speaker of the House, the Senate Majority Leader, and the heads of the intelligence communities in both the Senate and the House. And uh, it became public. It was read into the congressional record. Uh, we received feedback that the Speaker of the House uh, felt that the letter would provide impetus towards meeting the objectives of Congress to try to get action taken at the border that would, would add the security that we need at this time. So I'll pause there for any questions, but I have other comments. Well, I wanna, and so, you know, what's interesting, uh, Kevin, is that the FBI director, regardless of how we may feel about him, and, and I know that uh, you gentlemen that were actually in the Bureau have your own, I would say, perception of Christopher Ray, but he has repeatedly spoken about concern, starting with about nine months ago, and, and the hearings that I mentioned to you that I witnessed, uh, Senate hearings, where he was expressing concern for the safety of this country, he said the country's southern border is a threat to our national security. He additionally mentioned that every 12 hours are opening up cases regarding China's activity in the United States. You know, it's almost as if these words fall on deaf ears. You know, I'm watching them chase, chase Mallorca and trying to impeach him, which has just become like a dog and pony show, because we all know, even after the, Cong I mean, the House of Representatives impeaches we're not going to have the Senate removed, much the same way we did with Bill Clinton when he committed perjury over oral copulation sitting in the West Wing of the White House. We didn't see fit that a, a president can't lie to the American public and, more important, commit a felony per perjury. But, you know, I, I'm struggling to understand what it is about the hierarchy of the Bureau, independent of McCabe, that these guys aren't just up in arms because it's about 12,000 FBI agents, based on my assessment. You and Tom would know better, of course. Um, what is it they intend on them doing once these, these, these agents who have penetrated our southern border? And there's no question that some percentage of them are agents. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you just understand anything about statistics, I'm not even going to use the 10% rule. If it's 1%, it could be dramatic. What is it we're not getting here? You know, and I listen to all the fancy speeches and posturing in, in the House and the Senate. W what is it going to take, uh, independent of another 9-11 style attack? Now, I, I want to bring in Texas into this right away. Texas has chosen to basically shut their own border, even though that's the direct responsibility of the federal government. So now we've got a, a kind of handle on one point of influx, I think we'll agree on that. Well, now they've shifted to California. They're coming through uh, Hakumba and San Ysidro in record numbers now. And there's absolutely no mechanism, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, no mechanism in place to even, I guess, encounter them. Am I correct in that assumption? From news reports, it looks like people are coming across the border and actually waiting for Border Patrol to encounter them, and Border Patrol has been scarce. Uh, so, yes, the, the flow has been diverted uh to the california border the cartels aren't stupid they're going to go where it's easiest to get their clients uh, across the border um and there is no impediment california has declared itself to be a sanctuary state well that'll be tested um and so let me make a couple points lou on what you just said about uh, the director and um and the fbi's position and all of this it actually was a testimony that he and Mayorkas, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, delivered uh, before one of the committees back in November, I think, that uh, was one of the impetus for the letter itself. Um, Christopher Ray, sitting next to Mayorkas, addressed some of the national security concerns uh, relating to terrorism. And this is after the October 7th horrific attack in is Israel by Hamas. Um, and his remarks with the secretary sitting next to him centered on lone wolves, white supremacists, and others in this country as leading terror threats. There's no doubt they are terror threats, but 
they're not the leading threats. And um, when you have an influx of Middle Eastern males coming into this country uh, who could mount a similar type of attack as was witnessed in Israel, that's of grave concern. And yet it was not mentioned at all during that testimony with the two of them sitting together. Christopher Ray has made other good comments about the vulnerabilities of the southern border. But if the FBI were serious about this, under their counterintelligence uh, responsibilities, uh, they would have teams of agents at the border right now interviewing every Chinese national that came across. And within 24 hours, FBI agents would be able to determine whether these individuals are operating under operational orders whether they are going to be participating in some provisional plan should it be deemed necessary by the leaders of the PRC at some point. It's not hard to do. The FBI knows how to get that kind of information. But I see no evidence that that's taking place or hear of no evidence that that's taking place. Uh, that's a gaping hole in, in the Bureau's counterintelligence responsibilities. Let me ask you this, Kevin. What do you think the long-term goal or agenda is of this government? I mean, the things we're speaking about, it's not like we had to be rocket scientists to figure this out. You gentlemen clearly have a, a leg up on everyone because it was your line of work, your area of expertise. But for the average American that just turns on the news every day, if you're following the disruption, the dysfunction that's occurring in our major cities, for example, in forms of multiple forms of violence and criminal activity, what is the what's the agenda here, uh, Kevin? And I'm going to go to you, Tom, in a second because I want to talk to you about uh, our air marshals. I heard something from you about reassignment, but what what do you think we're trying to do here? Are we trying to redefine this country? Uh, to the liking of Barack Obama? Is that what this is about? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I was invited to uh, submit an op-ed uh, to The Hill, which I'll do this week. And in it, I'll give you a preview of, of one of my uh, conjectures. And, and that is, it ties back to an executive order that Joe Biden signed either the first or second day he was in office. And in that executive off, uh, order, he required that during the next census, which will be in 2030, he won't be in office. Uh, so hopefully the executive order will not uh, be enforced. But that executive order mandated that every human soul in the country be counted, whether they're a citizen or not. That's not the current law. Um, by doing this... <clears throat> the Democrat Party stands to gain congressional seats and electoral college votes by counting everybody in the country, even though millions of them are not ineligible to vote. But their presence counts as, um, as a statistical justification for additional congressional seats and electoral college votes. So using that as a backdrop, uh, one can start to understand a political strategy, a very cynical political strategy to open the borders and allow the free flow of illegal immigration into the country. The, the travesty of all of that is that it has placed political party power aspirations above the safety and security of the American people. And we have seen that since the surge, crime has spiked perpetrated by Ill illegal aliens. The number of Ill illegal aliens who came come to our border and are encountered and are uh, minimally vetted to determine that they have prior criminal histories has spiked. And so there are more criminals trying to get into the country. Those that are here in the country are committing more crimes. Uh, we have seen evidence of that just this week with the um, poor young college student at University of Georgia who was um, killed by an illegal, or suspected to be killed, allegedly killed by an illegal alien from Venezuela. Um, how many, how many people who have died in this country have been violently assaulted or murdered in this country? Does it take to justify this political position of one party 
to allow greater numbers into the country so that they can gain politically. I'm wondering if at some point, Kevin, we're going to see backlash from, from the country as a whole. You know, I'm born and raised in the city of New York. I went to 16 years of Catholic school, grammar school, high school and college in the city limits. You know, the Northeast is politically on its own sheet of music, which I don't fully understand. And the three of us, you, myself, Tom, TJ, actually the four of us, we're academics by background. You know, we're 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 in this mode of intellectualization, number one, on problem solving, which has an application after you've arrested a problem. In other words, when someone's beating up a woman in the street and they're of indigent circumstance, I fix that problem by whatever means necessary. And then I'll go back and revisit as to why we have a propensity, for example, to have more minorities participate in violent crime as opposed to mainstream America, even though they represent 13%. And that's tied to socioeconomic conditions. I don't want to go further than that in this discussion because I could go off with this. I fully understand it. I, I've mentioned before, I was born in Brooklyn at Bedford-Stuyvesant. We were the only white family on the block. I had no friends, you know, and up till probably seven, eight years old that weren't black, period, end of discussion. So I have a, a very, not a soft spot in my heart, but a very clear understanding of where we failed in that effort. But that being said, when we're addressing these issues, they've got to be addressed in their immediacy and then go back and try to break down as to root cause. I love this new term. It's the new expression we're throwing around now, the root cause. But it's just disturbing the path, the trajectory that the country's on. And the American public is sitting by here idly for the most part. Now, you, you and I, what I was just referencing to before I went off on a tangent is that whole northeast of the United States, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, even Maryland. Pennsylvania is tough for me to figure out. It's a very conservative state. Liberal gun laws got a Democrat Republican, uh, excuse me, a Democrat governor and Fetterman, who's a House of Representatives. There's a little lack of consistency there, but there's a mentality that exists that, that they're having a hard time getting the memo. You know, and what's going to ac accompany this issue of going on, for example, what's going on in our major cities is we're going to lose our major cities the same way we lost Detroit. You lose your tax base, which is happening as we speak in New York City, compounded by the fact of what's driving that isn't just a migration issue. It's a lack of management of crime overall. It's where I come from, compounded with the costs associated with fueling the migrant problem. The 24% raise they just gave to the police, that's long overdue and, and well-deserved. Where are you getting the money for this? We have Palestinian protests. This, this is going on. This pattern's going on throughout cities. But what is it the public doesn't see? What's interesting, Kevin, is if you look at communities in Boston and communities in Chicago, the minority communities are up in arms because they're starting to realize that funding allocated for them or environments that are designed to facilitate their needs are suddenly being diverted into migrants. It's staring us in the face, folks. W what is it that's going to wake or rattle this country up? And I've got to tell you something, Kevin, and I don't want to go off on another tangent about this election coming up, but I'm worried that if the conservative element, I'm not talking about Republicans because I'm conservative. I'm very conservative, especially when it comes to your safety. These other issues when we bump into about people's lifestyles and things, I'm not interested in hearing about anybody's personal life, just how I feel. I'm worried about the bumping into this this uh, this pro-choice issue again, which derailed us in November of 20, November 8, 2022, and this last November. I'm worried that if we don't get this country back on track this November, we're going to lose the country in totality. I, I, I don't know what it is it's going to take until the American public understands we're in a crisis, not just our cities, but nationwide. Tom, I want to come to you for a second because we're still going to stay on this immigration issue. I'm hearing now that we're now diverting assets like sky marshals who protect our planes to the southern border. Is that correct, Tom? Right. The air marshal service, you know, <laughs> was actually started by President Kennedy many years ago because we had so many planes being hijacked and going to Cuba at the time. But since 9-11, it was expanded to uh, put an air marshal on many of the flights that were deemed the highest risk of possible hijacking to be used in a terrorist act or, you know, other bad means. Now, what's happened now is that a uh, retired supervisory air marshal, 
Sonia Lobosco, is now saying that uh, many air marshals now are being taken off of duty on the planes, securing our air transportation. And many have been diverted to the southern border, not to do law enforcement functions, but to help hand out sandwiches and food and other, you know, other benefits to the migrants as they come across. And then other air marshals have been diverted at the request of the FBI to help hunt down January 6th suspects using geo tracking to see who was in Washington, D.C. Might not have even been at the Capitol that day, tracking credit card, tr uh, tracking transportation to Washington, other things like that that indicate people that were in D.C. at the time of January 6th and may have somehow been participants in the uh, the protest or the riot that day, even if they didn't go in the Capitol. Geotracking will say through telephone records whether they even did or not, whether they were just out on the on the lawn or whether they were at the White House for President Trump's speech at the time and didn't even go in the Capitol. But all of these people are suspects and they're using air marshals now to conduct surveillance of them. No, I wish I could say I was surprised, but I'm not. And what I'm really concerned about is that the FBI, which is our lead law enforcement agency in this country, may be so broken at this time that they're no longer part of the solution, that they may be the problem or a big part of the problem. You know, um, uh, we were just speaking before about Texas closing its borders and the focus now of the illegal immigrants is now Southern California, communities like Acumba and San Ysidro out of just on San Diego. And I just to remind everyone, the governor in his omnipotent wisdom just signed a law giving over three quarters of a million illegal immigrants comprehensive health care regardless of age. I'm only going to ask you once again, who's paying for this, folks? Now you've got them coming into a sanctuary state, as Kevin Brock just pointed out. They're immediately eligible for that. I don't think anybody understands what the hell is going on here. And I know, Tom, you'll argue with me with other colleagues of yours from the FBI. We've overpopulated this country to the extent that we cannot manage it responsibly on any level. You know, I just I see what's just coming apart at the seams. And I'm wondering what's going to be the break point? You know, is it is it we need course correction? You know, did the founding fathers allude to a revolution to get us back on track? Is that what they once said, Tom? Is was that their feeling, do you think? Well, basically, the philosophy was that if the government is not serving you, then fix it or replace it. Vote in new people. So trying to avoid the issue of having an armed rebellion, but to use our democratic process to do that. So, you know, that's been that's been an issue since early 250 years ago in our republic. You know, Tom, Kevin, you know, what, what I'm what I've grown up to learn, and the three of us grew up in a different America, that today we're just living one gigantic lie, and it doesn't matter what issue we bump into. You know, I, I before we came on, I mentioned the fact that we're now embarking on the 28th state that will embrace constitutional carry. So we're clear about what that means. That means by virtue of the Second Amendment of the Constitution, if you live in the state of Florida or Texas or Georgia or Utah or any number of these states, you may carry a concealed weapon without a permit, which means if a gun exists in your home, you can pick it up and carry it. Or if you haven't been convicted of a felony, you can go down to a gun store and buy one and carry it. And the only all we know about you is you haven't been convicted of a felony, which bumps into this whole discussion about mental health and the fact that it's the common denominator to all your mass shootings, along with failed parenting. Just something I wanted to mention, ladies and gentlemen, because another big lie, they keep throwing this gun control. Every talk, every time they talk about gun, draw, gun control, guys, just so we're clear, nothing does more for gun sales than discussions about gun control because we're living in a country that your police, through no fault of their own, have had their claws taken out of them. They're not going to be there for you. Don't believe anything different than that. That's my world. The public is afraid and nervous as a result of that. They don't trust the government. We're living in epic times that our children are being born into a world that unlike the three of us, Tom, Kevin, we believe and trusted the government. We didn't question the media. We never questioned science or medicine. 
or our educational institutions, which we just went through with the University of Pennsylvania, MIT, Harvard, and Johns Hopkins. You know, we're tearing the teeth out of this country. We're robbing it of its integrity. Kevin, I, I want to come back into you for a second here and just ask you about this thing with Smirnoff, another bureau uh, issue that they've arrested this individual that they have acknowledged, and please correct me if I'm wrong, as a very credible source of information for an extended period of time that they paid a considerable amount of money to. You shed some light on this, Kevin? Yeah, sir. Happy to. Um, I think this the Alexander Smirnoff case illustrates <laughs> in uh <laughs> illustrates clearly one of the more difficult roles that an FBI agent takes on in his or her career. And that is the development and management of sources, confidential sources of information. The Bureau calls them confidential human sources. Um so at any given time operating any source you're you're to vet that source on on two things number one the credibility of the information that the source provides is it accurate number two the reliability of the source does the source follow instructions does the source show up when they're supposed to show up does the source do the things that you are tasking the source to do um uh, they're evaluated on on both legs of, of that stream. Not all not all sources are credible, can be very reliable. Some are very reliable, their information is not always credible. Sometimes their information is spectacular, accurate, and used as foundational evidence in, in probable cause statements and, and other things for searches and arrests. Sometimes the information from the very same source can be 180 degrees off. These are the realities of managing confidential human sources. They are individuals who are in a position to provide information about bad things that are happening. Therefore, their lives are not always the kinds of lives that normal people would lead in this country. They are swimming in, in the pool of, uh, of, in, of the underbelly of society. So you're going to encounter that. Smirnov is a Russian, was Russian by birth, he and the bureau would know this at the time would have contacts with russian intelligence um the bureau's not averse to talking to people who have those contacts uh the bureau is going to test to see whether they can use that person to their advantage and they're going to take the information that they get that does provide that is accurate and run with that um so when Alexander Smirnov in 2020 came to his FBI handlers and said, hey, I've got reliable information or I've got credible information that the Bidens accepted $5 million in bribes from the Ukrainian uh, power company uh, to protect them. The Bureau takes that information. The Bureau's not going to turn away that. They're going to write down that information as it was received on an initial intake form called a 1023. So that's raw reporting. It's before it's vetted, it's before it's checked for accuracy, um, but the information was provided. Congress, through a whistleblower, finds out that this 1023 exists with these spectacular claims against the Bidens, which is highly attractive to a Republican-controlled House that is looking into the activities of the Bidens while well, Bi Joe Biden was vice president and a private citizen and later as president. So they demand this record, this 1023. Chris Ray says, you're not going to get it. We don't provide source information uh, that works against our guarantees to provide amenity and confidentiality to our sources. If we disrupt that, we lose access to people who are willing to give us information. Reasonable, reasonable argument. Plus, he says, this is raw reporting. It's unvetted. So Congress throws a tantrum, you know, subpoenas, issues subpoenas, threatens the director with contempt. So he allows them to look at the document. The Republicans have nobody to blame but themselves on this one, I'm afraid. Uh, they're the ones that wanted to make political hay out of it, and they ran with it. The FBI, I think, by inference, we can deduct 
that they did their due diligence and determined that the information was not credible. That's why we saw no, we saw no follow-up indictments, grand jury testimony, or anything else regarding a spectacular bribery accusation like that. Um, but that information was not sought by the Congress. That follow-up vetting information was not sought by the Congress. So now you've got a special counsel, David Weiss, who decides, you know, I've got to get some stats here. So I'm going to, I'm going to charge this confidential human source with lying to the FBI. Well, if the Department of Justice spent its time charging every single FBI confidential human source with lying to the FBI, that's all they would be doing because the FBI has lied to every single day. I have to interrupt for a second, if I may. So, you know, you said something very important. You said that the FBI vetted this information provided to them in 2020. Here's the fly in the ointment for me. So the same FBI that were the architects of killing Hillary Clinton in the past when she should have been prosecuted clearly for mishandling classified information and destroying information in her possession, emails and devices, right? Under subpoena. That's the FBI was supposed to trust vetted this information. You see, this is where the politics intersect with, with what the Bureau is doing today, if you understand what I'm saying. Completely Maybe. understand, and I don't disagree with you. You understand? I'm just throwing this out here, Kevin. No, it, it is. This is the the legacy of damage uh, done by the Comey administration of the FBI. Because Thank you, what they did, you know, they launched an unpredicated investigation into the Donald Trump campaign. There was no basis for the investigation. I've read the the. Um, did they charge anybody for lying about that, Kevin? No, nobody has been held accountable. People got fired. Struck got fired. McCabe got fired. Uh, McCabe, you know, the current DOJ restored to McCabe all the all the uh, penalties that he suffered. Uh, Struck got fired, but he has a lucrative uh, network contract with MSNBC. Um, and, you know, Jim Comey writes books and has town halls and, and makes all kinds of money off of this sordid episode and nobody has been held accountable for it. The American people are rightly suspect of what has happened. And frankly, uh, some episodes that have happened post Comey where you have the FBI participating in a shameful search of a journalist in New York four journalists in New York over the, um, over the president's daughter's diary, uh, where early morning raids were launched on journalists who had volunteered to turn the diary over to law enforcement. Um, and I, for the life of me, struggled to find the federal crime there. Uh, it's a it's a diary worth maybe 20 bucks at Kmart. You know, there's no, it doesn't reach prosecutive standards for uh, interstate transportation of stolen property. Uh, it is simply an effort by the Southern Judicial District of New York to do the bidding of a president who is going to be embarrassed by his daughter's diary. The FBI participated in that search and they never should have. The FBI's participation in the search of Mar-a-Lago should not have uh, happened. Uh, the FBI's early morning arrest of a pro-life father in front of his family who had volunteered to turn himself in and could be found every Wednesday praying the rosary outside a uh, Planned Parenthood clinic should not have been arrested that way. Uh, and the FBI should not have participated in that. So there are things that the FBI has done that has shaken the confidence uh, of, the, uh, of the American people. But at the direction of leadership that is not behaving as they should, this is not an indictment of the entire 13,000 agents of the FBI who every day are combating human trafficking, child exploitation, computer intrusions, uh, you know, healthcare fraud against seniors, violent crimes around the country. Day in and day out, they're doing what the American people expect the FBI to do. That, that's the disservice that I mention all the time to, and Tom, I bring this up with, with Tom as well. 99 and 99% of the FBI are on track. You know, we we experience the same thing in local law enforcement. You have one knucklehead in the precinct, the whole precinct is tainted. You know, yes. we want to stereotype. But the reality of the situation is um, the, 
the overall composition of the FBI is what we believe it should be. We have a, a, a few problems here. I, I want to bring up something, Tom, that you know you you and um, Kevin will both plug into. When we MP, first of all, let me let me set the stage and correct me where I'm wrong. Hmm. The FBI comes out and says Smirnoff provided lots of credible information, built cases. We paid him hundreds of thousands of dollars, and all of a sudden we've impugned this guy's character and credibility. Doesn't that open up these cases that he provided information on? Doesn't it open them up for review? Was anybody thinking about this? Because we deal with that in the police department. We catch a bad cop, a bad detective, whatever cases he may have uh, rushed up against, we're looking at these cases to overturn them. Tom, you want to break in first? No, that's true. It, uh, it taints the cases. It could result in some cases being overturned or thrown out or uh, convictions, you know, reversed. But one of the aspects of this, um, and Kevin can comment also, I ran the informant program in Chicago for two years be uh, before I got promoted to my first supervisory position. And, you know, the, the FBI, when it gets that kind of information, it does be required to vet it, let's say, that it's not true. Now, in most of these cases, you have informant information that may may lead as, as a predicate to opening an investigation or doing further investigation, but may not be the basis later of the prosecution or the evidence used. It's just information that leads the Bureau to either open or consider a case, something like that. It's not the end all beat all. And typically a long term, a long term confidential source does not testify. This is information that's provided for lead information only. So later when you have the Durham report come out and they, and they use the term that they opened cases that weren't predicated properly, that means predication is the legal term that means that, yes, there was enough information there to conduct further investigation, but it may not be what was used in the actual prosecution. So some cases could, could be overturned, not every single thing this person reported but on. I, I got another big question for both you gentlemen sitting, you know, listen, this should become frying the FBI today. You know, we're just speaking candidly about some deficiencies with literally less than a handful of people in that agency that have just harmed the integrity and the honor and everything associated with this FBI. But just to go back in time now, so 2020, gentlemen, Smirnoff rears his head and says $5 million was transacted. Um, is there a window of time normally we would vet that? In other words, if you got what I'm going with, Tom, he got this, in, the FBI got this in 2020. It took him three plus years to figure out that they wanted to prosecute the guy. If if upon receipt of this information, you realize it was bad information, you should either shut that CI down or, or prosecute him then. So my question to you gentlemen is, if this information was provided in 2020, what's the window of time that the FBI would have taken to vet this information to determine its credibility. Kevin, you want to take the first crack at it? And then I'm going to come back to you, Tom. Sure. We don't know, obviously, the precise <laughs> procedures that the FBI followed in this case uh, as far as vetting that information. Uh, I don't think it, it's exactly fair to characterize it as a three-year, and I've seen this in the press, where I said, why did it take the FBI three years to determine that this guy was lying? That's not what the indictment says. Uh, the FBI could have very quickly determined that the uh, that Smirnoff's information about the five million dollar payoff was was not accurate, was not credible, um, and that's why nothing was really done about it. Three years later, David Weiss, the special counsel, special prosecutor, decides, for I think more political reasons than than legal reasons, to charge. Smirnoff with lying to the FBI. I read the indictment. He's not making the charges based on any confession made by Smirnoff. He is basically basing the indictment on inconsistencies between what Smirnoff said and dates of travel and dates of meetings that he claimed he had that the prosecutor feels are inconsistent with his story. In other words, he couldn't he this couldn't have happened because he wasn't where he said he was uh, when he told the FBI this. So this is this is evidentiary on its face. It's circumstantial. Um, but that's what the indictment is based on. It's not a confession. It's not 
there's not anything so the the to, in order to in order to convict smirnov of lying to the fbi uh, the prosecution is going to have to come up with some solid evidence to do so and uh i don't see smirnov uh, uh, pleading to this so it'll be an interesting process to see whether this case actually comes comes to court so i have another question before i go to you tom um in 2020, an allegation was put forth that $5 million was given to Hunter and $5 million was given to Joe. Um, wouldn't it be a paper trail? Are they suggesting that they took $5 million in cash? You know, you know what I'm saying? In other words, I handled one time, believe it or not, Kevin, $2 million, and it was really kind of confusing. A Brinks truck brought it to the curb of a bank for whatever reason, they hired us privately, this was in LA, to take it into that facility. And $2 million in $100 bills is quite cumbersome. It's a large bundle, I'm sure you know. $5 million, I'm trying to figure out, hmm. So we transacted this $5 million. Did they do it in cash? What uh, You see, look, I'm an investigator by trade too. So are we looking at purchases that Biden made that wouldn't support his income? Which is a good question today based on the fact that it's a, U.S. Senator, he was making $180,000 a year, maybe, and he's got three multi-million dollar homes. You know, we, you know, this is about sourcing. Guys, look, I'm not an FBI agent, but I didn't fall off the back of the Apple truck. I've been in this community over 50 years. My brain works the same. I'm trying to figure out how was that money transacted? Was the FBI incapable of, of determining what did that in fact take place? You understand where I'm going with this, Kevin? In other words, We've I do. decided to impugn this guy's character and credibility. He made an allegation. I would think it'd be relatively simple to factually substantiate whether or not this money was transacted, especially to the tune of $10 million we're talking about. It had to manifest itself. Guys, let me tell you a fast story about me real quick. I worked for the Minister of Finance of Saudi Arabia in the um, Four Seasons Hotel in LA just prior to 9-11. This man gave me a $50,000 gratuity cash. You know why I'm saying that? I took that money. I put it in the bank. I don't play with cash. I'll go to jail for a lot of reasons, not money. And I said to my sister who made the deposit, I said, Roberta, what am I going to do with it? If I buy a car, I use it as a down payment on a house. I buy a boat. If something happens and I bump it to IRS, they might ask me to source that money. Correct, Kevin? You see where I'm going with this train of thought? Yeah, the, the uh, Minister of Finance in Saudi Arabia is probably not going to send you a, a 1099 at the end of the year. So, uh, yeah, you have to create your own money trail right there. But, but you're you're bringing up a larger point here. Uh, and that is the irony of all of this is that there is enough information in the public domain about the behaviors of Joe Biden and his son Hunter and his brother Jim to build a case at minimum of influence peddling um, and, and and I believe also money structuring, money laundering uh, without Alexander Smirnoff's allegations. So and where's without the bureau, Kevin, Kevin, so I ask you, where's the bureau? Well, this is what we don't know. So we don't know where that case is or if there is a case proceeding along those lines. Uh, so... And, and it could explain the frustration of the House Republicans thinking, well, you know, we need this $5 million allegation to be true to finally push this over the finish line. But um, I don't think that's the case. That there should be enough right now to mount a grand jury investigation and indictment against the Bidens based on what we know publicly. Tom, can I get your opinion or chime in on this, please? No, I agree 100 percent with uh, Kevin on that. There's enough information. And don't forget, Lou, you're talking about how these transactions occurred or how did they get into the Biden bank accounts? You know, much of the uh, the records, many of the records obtained by the House committee, by Comer's committee, were based on almost 200 suspicious activity reports filed with FinCEN, the, which is an element of the Department of the Treasury, which enforces money laundering and looks into suspicious activity, suspicious deposits. So, you know, they've used that as the basis to issue subpoenas to look for bank records, uh, international records, as well as from banks here to try to figure out where the money came from, 
where it went and uh, you know the, the background of the cash that's alleged. So they have many of the records that the House committee is showing publicly and has shown publicly for several months now are based on investigation predicated or based on suspicious activity reports, which go to Treasury and say, something's wrong with this transaction, you, sh you should look into it. And that's where a lot of the basis for these transactions has come from. Guys, that's going to wrap it for today's uh, podcast. You know, I I cannot quantify the value of your your knowledge and your insight, and the, and the byproduct of your career commitment. You know, guys, this is not you know you're listening to a podcast that is not designed to be contentious. We're just trying to tell you the truth. We're not politically aligned with anyone. I can only speak for myself and Tom now. I won't speak for Kevin at this juncture. I hope in the future I will be able to align his thinking with ours. We're, we're Americans first. We're fathers first. Tom is a grandfather. I love this country. I've traveled this world. I've traveled this country up and down, back and forth. The thing, the mistake we're making here, we're taking this for granted. We've taken our eye off the ball, and I'm worried about the future of this country, and I think both these gentlemen are as well. We're going to come back um, for another podcast this next episode. Kevin will be with us again as Tom will. We're going to talk about this immigration issue because you guys need to pay attention to what's happening to your country. It's going to have a direct impact upon you. I also want to talk about Navalny. I would like to talk about the Ukraine because we keep talking about this funding issue and Putin's agenda with occupying all of the East, former Soviet nations in the East Bloc. Bah, 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 bah. You know, we have so much misinformation out here intentionally generated as to confuse, and I would say, deter the American public from really biting into some of these problems. I always say something about foreign policy, guys. You know, I've lived an interesting life. I've had a lot of good fortune. These foreign policies aren't as complicated as we make the, as we make them out to be. And the reason we do is to deter, deter you from really biting into them. Sometimes you just look at it on the surface and it is what it is. I'll tell you the common denominator in life, and I don't care where you are on the planet, it's money, 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 money. You can have an adversary all day long. You sit down with this guy and say, listen, let's put our differences aside for a moment. We're going to make a ton of money. I guarantee you the guy will rock with that program. Guys, thank you so much for um, listening to this podcast or viewing it. Tom, I thank you as always. My colleague, my my co-conspirator. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. And, and, and provider of an enormous amount of wisdom. Kevin, I'm going to have you right back in this next episode. And um, we're going to take a break and we're going to come right back, guys. We'll see you shortly. Oh, yeah, before I forget, Operation Truth Official at gmail.com. Don't be shy about communicating with us and don't be shy about challenging us. We're here to be held accountable, something the government's not. Okay, guys, we'll see you next podcast. Thank you.